Okay, looks good. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see everybody that is here right now. I'm sure we'll have a few more. Uh, last I checked, there were still three or four students working on the 930 quiz, and I wouldn't be surprised if some other students are preparing for their quiz later on. Oh, looks like one of the students that I saw finishing the quiz is joining right now, actually. Okay. Uh, right now, the average grade wasn't too bad, actually, for the quiz five. I think I've said repeatedly that uh, quiz five would be most likely the hardest quiz of the semester. Uh, there were students who normally get A's, if not high A's, that did not get A's. Uh, so in that case, it was correct. But the overall average grade was pretty close uh, to what I've seen so far. I think the average grade is probably a little over 70% last I checked, which uh, isn't too bad for that quiz. Uh, that quiz, when we get to quiz five, it's usually around 60 or 65%. So uh, you guys overall did a pretty good job uh, from what I've seen. Uh, a couple of students who normally make high A's that didn't make A's this time look like the organizations tripped you up. You guys did a good job on the individuals, but the, the organizations got you back, uh, got you on those. Um, but you guys are making high A's anyway, so it's not a big deal. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, move on. I'm going to mention a couple of things first. Uh, the final exam study guide is in Blackboard. Uh, for two of my 1302 classes, the ex final exam is going to be Thursday of next week. Uh, so my 9.30 a.m. class and my 12.30 p.m. class, both of those on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, remember, you guys have your your final exam next week, Thursday, April 30th. Uh, so make sure you're ready for that final exam. Again, the study guide is in Blackboard. Uh, the final exam, I'll post more information about the final exam next week. Uh, I believe I have it scheduled to release at our normal class time. But I think I set it up where you have like maybe 12 hours to take it. I could be off, so maybe I shouldn't be saying anything right now. Uh, but I know I set it up with more time. Uh, I'm getting a little confused with what I'm doing for you guys and what I'm doing for my Maymester class. Uh, right after the semester ends, I'll be teaching a Maymester class, so I'm also working on that class schedule and exams and quizzes for, the, for that class coming up, too. Um, but uh, make sure you're ready for that for my uh, Tuesday, Thursday, 11 a.m. class. The final exam will be two weeks from today, so that'll be, what is that, May... What is, what's that uh, date? May 5th? I think it's May 5th. Uh, so May 5th, make sure you're ready for that exam for my 11 a.m. class. Uh, I do have two dual credit classes that meet Mondays and Wednesdays. You guys will uh, take the final exam on, I, I'm thinking, I think that's probably May 4th, the, the uh, first Monday of May. Um, and we'll go ahead and start covering the um, Vietnam era. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on John F. Kennedy, uh, but we'll introduce him. Uh, There's a pretty good chance that there would be one or two questions that come up about Kennedy. So we'll try to make this pretty factual uh, as opposed to going into a lot of depth in, in uh, discussing, these, uh, discussing Kennedy. Uh, so we'll mention this first. Of course, this is John F. Kennedy. Let me make sure I've got my little hand. Oops. Okay. This has been wrong. There we go. So, of course, here's... Uh, John F. Kennedy, right over here. And in 1960, John F. Kennedy ran against Richard Nixon for the presidential nomination. John F. Kennedy is your Democrat. Richard Nixon is your Republican. Uh, John F. Kennedy had an unremarkable career. Uh, hadn't done a whole lot in Congress. Uh, he'd been in the House of Representatives for a few years. Uh, went on to be in the Senate in the 1950s, uh, was not really like a leading member of the Senate, but he was well known. Uh, his family was very wealthy. Um, he was uh, a World War II veteran, uh, as was Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon um, was also a rep, but he was better known. Remember, uh, during the House Un-American Activities Committee, Nixon really became uh, a very well-known representative before making it into the United States Senate and then becoming vice president for the next eight years from 1953 to 1961. 
Uh, so he's vice president when he's running for president in 1960. Uh, so Nixon had more skins on the wall, I guess you might say. Uh, but Kennedy was popular. He was a good speaker. Uh, if you look at the two guys, uh, you'd probably say that Kennedy is the better looking guy out of the two. Um, let me do something real quick on my YouTube just to make sure that my volume is up. Okay, yeah, we're good. Um, uh, so this is going to be, the, the looks will come into play here in 1960, because in 1960 we have the very first televised presidential debate. Uh, so it's not just about what people sound like. You know, before 1960 you had debates pretty pretty often, uh, but from the 1930s and 40s to the 50s, you'd normally hear them, not see them. And Kennedy looks very polished. He's a handsome guy. He's young. He's, well, he's articulate. Uh, Richard Nixon's a very intelligent guy, but he looks nervous. Uh, he was actually sick when this debate happened, uh, so he didn't look real comfortable. Uh, so it's always said, or it's often said, that if you watch the debate, Kennedy won. If you heard the debate on the radio, then Nixon won. Uh, but so it really depends. But looks do come into play here, um, especially with the advent of the TV. Remember, the television really came in to play in the late 40s, but became much more common by the time we get to the late 1950s going into 1960. So Kennedy wins the election. It's a very close election. So if we go over to this map, uh, we'll look at the popular vote real quick, right? The popular vote, 49.7% to 49.5%. So really close there. Now, again, we don't, we know that the popular vote is not what really matters. What really matters is the electoral vote. The electoral vote, it looks like there's a little more space between them, 303 to 219. Now, to become president, you had to win at least 270 electoral votes. So Kennedy's definitely got that, th that with the 303. But we're going to break this down just a little bit more because there were nine states in which the winner took less than 51% of the vote. Uh, so not only is it close nationally, but it's close in a lot of different states. So what I'm saying is basically if you give – Nixon, let's say Illinois, where he took 49.8% and Kennedy took 50%, uh, and you throw in maybe Hawaii and Delaware, uh, where again it's around 50% on each side, then Nixon is your president. So this was an election where literally every vote does count, right? If you have a few hundred people here and there not show up to the election, then you may not, uh, then you may have a different uh, winner in that election. But Kennedy wins this really close election. Uh, you can see how it's split across the country uh, with uh, Kennedy getting the blue states, Richard Nixon getting these red states. We saw Harry Byrd. Byrd was in that uh, Dixiecrat party that we saw earlier on, too. He's a Southern Democrat, and he wins Mississippi, uh, more of a segregationist with Strom Thurmond as the VP candidate. Uh, now we'll briefly talk about Kennedy t taking on the Cold War. Uh, let me move on over here. Okay, uh, so what we're going to see from Kennedy in addressing the Cold War is going to be, first of all, the expansion of special forces. So we start getting into building special forces in the United States Army in the 1950s, but now we're going to start seeing the advent of the Green Berets. Nixon wants to put more focus and energy on training uh, special elite soldiers for the during this Cold War, because as we go into the early 1960s, he thinks and military advisors say, well, maybe it's not really about having this full-scale war where hundreds of thousands or millions of troops are going to fight against Russians uh, somewhere in Europe or elsewhere. Uh, maybe it's going to be more about sending in small elite troops to undermine uh, leaders of communist uh, factions. So that's what these Green Berets are going to start doing. So we're going to focus more energy on Green Berets, small specialized units. Of course, you'll see like Navy SEALs and uh, some of these other special forces rise up as well. But the Green Berets are really going to expand in the 1960s under John F. Kennedy. Uh, 
he creates this alliance for progress. The alliance for progress just briefly said uh, this we would consider the Marshall Plan for Latin America. Uh, so you can compare this to the Marshall Plan. Remember, after World War II, United States government pitches in billions of dollars to, of aid to uh, Europe in, in an effort to reconstruct uh, Europe following World War II. Well, Latin American countries feel like they've been left out. You know, the United States is still making a lot of money off of Latin American countries, but we're not really putting a whole lot of money into Latin America. So what we're going to do in this Latin Alliance for Progress is we're going to spend about $20 billion, that's billion with a B, $20 billion in grants and loans to help build up Latin American industry, right? build up their economies. Now, while the Marshall Plan was really successful in the late 40s and early 50s, this Alliance for Progress is not going to do so well. In fact, by the time we get to the mid-1970s, 13 of those countries that we gave money to now have military dictatorships. Uh, so while we see democracy kind of rise up in the 50s and communists being staved off, uh, now we're going to see in Latin American countries, essentially political and military leaders take the money and fund their own governments. Uh, there will be some financial improvements, parks, airports, stuff like that, but a lot of that money is going to wind up being used to help uh, military dictatorships. Uh, but nevertheless, Kennedy would wind up being a pretty popular president in Latin America because of the money that we spend down there. Uh, Kennedy will also establish the Peace Corps. Peace Corps is still around today. We send out these young, idealistic, intelligent people to developing countries. So we used to call them third world nations. We'll call them developing nations. These developing nations are countries that aren't really like a big communist stronghold. They're not really big on capitalism. They don't have big economies. So we're gonna to try to help those developing nations build up their economies um, and basically show them that we're good people. So the Peace Corps is going to be a way of us sending out these idealistic, intelligent, hardworking individuals to these third world or developing nations and basically say, you know, as you grow, just remember the good things that we did for you. Right? That's going to be kind of the idea of the Peace Corps. Peace Corps is still around today. Um, around 8,000 Americans are enlisted in the Peace Corps. They serve two-year terms, or two-year tours. So they'll volunteer for like two years, basically. Um, now we'll go on to the Agency for International Development, AID. Uh, this will be another Kennedy program. And again, the, 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 the purpose of this is to help Latin American countries keep communism out. So what we're going to do with aid is provide funds to fight extreme poverty in these third world countries. We're going to invest a lot in agricultural productivity, and we're going to help with medical assistance and to elevate the role of women. Uh, so that's going to be aid in agriculture, help women, and, finance, um, and medical aid, right? All of that's going to be part of aid. Aid is still around today as well, uh, but it starts under John F. Kennedy. So we have these programs that we're establishing basically to make ourselves more attractive and friendlier to Latin American countries, uh, basically show people that are around the world that they should be de democratic capitalist countries, not communist nations. You know, that's kind of the idea behind this. Uh, now we'll move on to the Bay of Pigs. Uh, early on, remember, John F. Kennedy had just taken office in January of 1961 after the 1960 election. Uh, I mentioned briefly that after the Cuban Revolution, uh, after Fidel Castro took power in 1959, thousands of Cubans make their way over to the United States, and we start training some of them to go on back and invade in, uh, the Cuban in an effort to overthrow Castro's government, right, to, to remove communism. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't make much sense that we have this idea of containment in place ever since the late 1940s, and then right next to us, you know, Cuba's like 90 miles away from Florida. Uh, right next to us, right on our doorstep, we have a communist country. So we send about 2,000 armed rebels back to Cuba. So these are Cuban refugees who made their way to the United States. 
our central intelligence agency is going to train them and arm them. And then we're going to send them back to Cuba in an effort to, to raise this widespread rebellion. And at the same time, we're supposed to pro provide air support. So our planes are going to come in and knock out their planes. And the hope is that, you know, all these other Cubans who weren't communists would join the revolt and overthrow Castro's government. Now, it's not going to work out. Uh, the problem with this is nobody's going to know that we're delivering them, and the Cubans already know we're coming. Spies passed on information from the Soviet Union to Cuba that we were doing this. So when we're about to drop off those 2,000 refugees, 20,000 Cuban troops are there to meet them. So they just wipe out the 2,000, capture most of them, take them hostage or uh, as prisoners, kill over 100 of the Cuban refugees that we dropped off. Our air support winds up just back, we back off the air support because when we go to their airfields, we see that their planes are gone and, they know, and we know that they're prepared for us. So we essentially just deliver these Cuban refugees to be captured and imprisoned and killed. So it doesn't work out very well. This creates... Uh, a bitter situation that just exacerbates the situation with the Soviet Union, where the Soviet Union and Cuba are allies. They're both communist countries. Uh, so right after that Bay of Pigs fiasco, we have these uh, uh, this Vienna summit. Uh, so in Vienna, Austria, Don F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev meet. Khrushchev is your Soviet leader. Uh, Khrushchev has some pretty harsh words to say about Kennedy, in particular about Berlin. Remember, Berlin's been a sticking point since the end of World War II. Berlin is in East Germany, which is occupied by communist forces. Uh, but Berlin itself will split between West Berlin, which was a democracy, and East Berlin, which is communist. So what Khrushchev decides to do, in response to what we try to do, in Cuba is they erect this Berlin Wall. So in August of 1961, the Soviet Union orders this wall to be built around West Berlin. So this is like a 90 mile long wall. They build it over a two week period of time. At least the initial phase is built over a two week period of time. And now anybody who wants to go from East Berlin into West Berlin, there's a pretty good chance they're going to get shot or shot at, right? So now uh, this is going to be the Soviet Union's way of trying to keep people from leaving East Germany through West Berlin and trying to choke off West Berlin for the rest of Eastern Germany. Uh, so this wall is going to stand all the way until 1989. So it's going to stand for about 28 years, just over 28 years. Uh, so we have that Berlin Wall where you know, this, these uh, Soviet American relations are really deteriorating in the early 1960s. This will lead up to this Cuban Missile Crisis. This is also referred to as the October Crisis, and this would be in, in October of 1962. Now, I could go on in more detail about this, but again, I don't want to spend too much time because our time is limited today, and we only have two class periods left before the final. Uh, so we'll just say basically we find out that the Soviet Union, using U-2 spy planes, we find out that the Soviet Union is building nuclear missiles in Cuba, or, or at least uh, uh, placing them in Cuba. So we know this is happening. So October 14th, 1962, uh, John F. Kennedy finds out. He then is, issues a quarantine. Now, uh, we're going to call this a quarantine. Uh, basically, what we're going to say is that uh, no ships or other transportation can be let out of Cuba, uh, as opposed to a blockade. Now, uh, a blockade is considered an act of war. So if you blockade, if you put your naval ships off the coast of another country and you block anything from going in, and that's considered an act of war, and the president cannot declare a war. So it would be illegal, uh, you might say, for Kennedy to issue a blockade against a foreign country without Congress saying, let's go to war, since that would be considered an act of war. 
So this is kind of like a blockade, but he's gonna use the term quarantine, which I'm sure everybody at this point is very familiar with that term. Uh, so as opposed to a blockade where you're blocking anything from going in, the argument is we're using a quarantine that's going to keep anything from going out. Now, it'll serve the same purposes. Uh, so we're still going to have ships out there. It would essentially be a blockade. Uh, but now we have a very tense situation because it looks like we're going to war. Uh, we have this essentially something that resembles an act of war established. So for the next 12 or 13 days, we're going to see a lot of tension. And we're on the verge, it looks like, of having a nuclear war. Uh, we're going to say that this might be the point in time uh, where we have the where we come closest to going to war. Now, again, the reason the Soviet Union is doing this, or the reasons are, are, are as follows. One, if Cuba has nuclear bombs in Cuba, then it's less likely that the United States is going to try to overthrow Cuba again because now Cuba can just nuke us and keep us from uh, sending troops in. So right? that's going to be one of the reasons. Another reason the Soviet Union does this is because we have nuclear bombs uh, established in Turkey. Turkey, of course, is right next to the Soviet Union. So we have nuclear bombs uh, in Turkey, which means that we can pretty easily hit the Soviet Union from Turkey. And Soviet Union and Khrushchev basically say, if you guys can put bombs in Turkey right next to us, then we should be able to put bombs in Cuba right next to you. Right? This is one of those what's good for the goose is good for the gander type arguments. So Khrushchev is doing that for those two main reasons. He wants to make sure that we don't invade Cuba or try to overthrow their government. And two, he wants us to remove our missiles from Turkey. So Kennedy, in public view, Kennedy has this very hard line stance, uh, refusing apparently to back down to Soviet Union, and we're getting close to being going to war. So if so, some of you may have grandparents. Uh, maybe some of you may have had great grandparents uh, that lived through this era. And you're going to see this uh, kind of duck and cover, right? This is going to be an image of kids in school ducking in case a nuclear bomb is detonated in their vicinity, right? So now we're going to see kids. And like when I was growing up, it was what uh, I think we had like uh, bad weather. You know, if a tornado came by, duck and cover. Uh, we had the fire drills. I think those are the only two drills we had nowadays. Of course, you have the active shooter drills. Uh, but back in the 50s and 60s, especially in the early 60s at this point, uh, we have a lot of these duck and cover drills uh, just in case an atomic bomb is detonated. Now, there's no way hiding under a desk is going to save you from an atomic bomb, but maybe it made them feel a little bit better, right? Uh, so now we're, we're getting real tense. Now, essentially, October 26th, after 13 days, uh, of this October crisis, Khrushchev sends a message that he will remove the missiles from Cuba, and it looks it, on a couple of conditions. One, Kennedy has to publicly state that they will not invade Cuba, which he does. So Kennedy says, we will not invade Cuba. Now, secretly, what the American people were not told at the time is Kennedy also agrees to remove nuclear missiles from Turkey. I think they removed them from Italy and maybe England also, but definitely Turkey. So we're taking nuclear bombs out of Turkey. So Kennedy is kind of shown to be this big hero, right? He, he faced danger in the eye and, he, and Khrushchev backed down. That's the narrative, right? That's going to be what makes Kennedy kind of this heroic figure in October of 1962. But what actually happened is Kennedy did back down because Khrushchev was putting the bombs there as leverage to get our missiles out of Turkey, which we did. Now, we don't tell the American public we did this because then Kennedy looks bad and we look weak. Uh, but that's what winds up happening. Uh, so it's concealed from the American public that we actually removed these missiles. Uh, Oh, I'm going to show this other slide too. 
but Kennedy is basically portrayed to be a hero. The United States, of course, is shown to be this big, powerful country that's not going to back down from anybody, even though we kind of did. Now we go to this image here. Now, this graph uh, also shows how many nuclear bombs we we're building. So over time, it's going to be our U.S. stockpile of atomic bombs. That blue line represents the United States. And you can see in the early 1960s, we really spike up, right? We're building lots of nuclear bombs. Now, by the time we got to 1960, we had at least five times more bombs than Soviet Union. You can see maybe even more than that. Uh, Soviet Union really would have stood a chance of us if it's if we're saying atomic bomb for atomic bomb. Now, granted, uh, the, when Kennedy asked how many people would die if we went to war in a nuclear war, uh, Kennedy was told about 70 million people, which was a, pretty close to half of our country. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Now we're moving to the Vietnam era. Now my goal is to get to the Tet Offensive today. So we'll get into 1968. I don't think we'll have time to get to the uh, Democratic National Convention of the primaries, but, I, I, but I'm hoping we can get at least to the Tet Offensive January of 1968. Now, we'll give you a quick rundown on Vietnam under Kennedy. Actually, I'll give you a little bit of history first. Uh, remember, Vietnam, North and South Vietnam, used to be part of Indochina, and that was under French control. So Vietnam, both North and South Vietnam, was under French control going back to the 19th century all the way up to World War II. Now, remember, during World War II, we know that Japan went into Vietnam and took over that territory, kicking the French out. But we're going to liberate Vietnam, and part of that liberation was led by a guy named Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was a French communist, right? He went to school in France. Uh, he did follow the teachings of Marx and Lenin. Um, he rose to political power in the early 1920s originally, but he comes back to Vietnam and he wants to remove French imperial powers from Vietnam, right? So he's a French, sorry, he's a Vietnamese nationalist, right? He wants to empower Vietnam and remove it from French colonial control. And he's a communist, and of course, China, right next to Vietnam, is the is a big communist country, right? The biggest by population. So he leads a fight against the Japanese in World War II, and after the Japanese are removed, then he leads the fight against the French going to the early 1950s. By 1954, France signs this uh, armistice, this treaty which would give North Vietnam their independence under Ho Chi Minh's leadership. So North Vietnam is independent, and part of the agreement to end the fighting in 1954 was to split southern Vietnam or South Vietnam with North Vietnam at the 17th parallel. Right? That 17th parallel is going to separate uh, North Vietnam and South Vietnam. South Vietnam uh, is not run by the French, but it does have a lot of French influence. It'll be more of a capitalist democracy, although we'll see that the democracy does not favor everybody. And part of this agreement also said that in 1954, um, after 1954, we are going to hold elections in two years to see if the Vietnamese people want to reunite their nation. That election's not gonna happen. We're not gonna let that happen because we're going to establish something called the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO. So this will be an alliance of Southeastern um, Asian and Indian Ocean neighboring countries, like Australia will be part of this, right? Now this is gonna be just like NATO and also influenced by that Truman Doctrine of Containment. So basically, any country that was in CETO would be protected from a communist intrusion. South Vietnam will be part of that, which means if there's a threat of communist uprising in South Vietnam, uh, especially if it's in, uh, supported by China or Russia, 
uh, then we will help and other CETO member nations will help them out. So that election is not going to happen. So in 1954, North and South Vietnam are split and essentially established. Now, by, the, by 1955, a guy named Godin Ziem, this is Ziem's name right here. Uh, when we see that D start off a name in Vietnamese, it makes kind of a Z sound. So it's Godin Ziem. So Godin Ziem is going to leave South Vietnam. We're going to throw our support behind Godin Ziem. Uh, he is very much anti-communist. Uh, he is also very influenced by the French, and he is a Catholic. Uh, remember, the French historically were Catholic. Uh, South Vietnamese leaders were often Catholic, but the majority of the country was not Catholic, and that's going to become problematic as time goes by. Now, Ziem is getting support. Uh, we're going to send out Central Intelligence Agency uh, support. We're going to send out... Uh, a few and then larger numbers of military forces to work as advisors uh, to the South Vietnamese government. Uh, but Ziem tends to be kind of brutal towards people who weren't Catholic, uh, or he may give Catholics preferential treatment. Um, so there's uh, something called, oh, what is the name of it? It's uh, some kind of... It's kind of like a voluntary work, but I'm trying to think what it's called. It's uh, corvée. It's a term called corvée labor. Uh, don't worry about the term corvée labor. This is just an example. Corvée is spelled C-O-R-V-E-E. -E. Uh, corvée labor is kind of like this mandated labor that you provide for the government, like on a yearly basis. Uh, if you were Catholic, you didn't have to do that. But everybody else did, especially the Buddhists. And there's a lot of Buddhists in South Vietnam. So the Buddhists are going to protest Ziem's leadership. They don't want him to be a leader, but it's not a whole lot they can do as long as the United States is there and supporting Ziem. So they start, part of their protest is going to be self-immolation, right? They're going, to, they're going to see these Buddhist monks get in the street, douse themselves with gasoline. You can see the gasoline can right behind this monk that's on fire. They'll light themselves in a match, sit lotus style, and just burn to death without making a, without making a peep. Right? They're not going to make any sound while they kill themselves. And this will be all in protest of Ziem's government. So the Buddhists really wanted Ziem removed. Now, this image, I believe, wins a Pulitzer Prize. It's very well known. It's on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, <laughs> It's actually on the cover of a Rage Against the Machine CD from the early to mid-90s also. Uh, but this is going to bring national or international attention to this whole South Vietnam uh, Ziem issue. Uh, so by the time we get to October of 1963, there's a lot of pressure on Kennedy to allow Vietnamese generals to remove Ziem. So Kennedy, in October of 1963, said, go ahead and do it. So Ziem was then removed from power, and he was executed, as was his brother. So both Godin Ziem and his brother were both killed by Viet South Vietnamese leadership, military leadership, in October of 1963. What we're going to see after this is just a string of... Mm, very poor South Vietnamese leaders, uh, a lot of, um, I'm trying to think of what the word I want to use is, uh, a lot of corrupt leaders. Uh, a lot of these guys are going to kind of line their own pockets and empower themselves as opposed to looking out for the best interest of the people. So, and none of them are going to be as strong as Jim. So Jim was very, was a strong leader although not a very popular leader. Now we're going to have a bunch of unpopular leaders who aren't very strong. And that's what's going to wind up happening. So now we're very concerned about this domino theory. Right? We talked about this uh, when we mentioned the rise of the Cold War, this idea that if communism, communism spreads to South Vietnam, it would go to Cambodia and elsewhere. So we need to stop the dominoes from falling. 
So we're going to want to send more forces in as we get into 1964. Now, Kennedy is not going to have to answer for this decision to overthrow Jim without a concrete plan in place on who he's going to replace him with. Because about a month later, Kennedy himself was killed. Right? Driving through the streets of downtown Dallas, uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald, this former U.S. Marine who turned communist. Uh, so the vice president will now take over, and that was Lyndon B. or Lyndon Baines Johnson. So Johnson from Texas is now going to be president of the United States after Kennedy's assassinated. Now, LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, is going to want to aggressively fight against the spread of communism in South Vietnam. He's going to use this Gulf of Tonkin incident to expand our forces and escalate the war after August of 1964. And what this Gulf of Tonkin incident is, let me see if I've got, actually I'm going to go back to that other map real quick. So here's your Gulf of Tonkin right over here. So we had uh, naval ships, uh, more, more specifically uh, American destroyer ships in the Gulf of Tonkin, basically to kind of police the area in support of South Vietnam. News is reported to Lyndon B. Johnson that North Vietnamese boats torpedoed American destroyer ships. So the next day, Lyndon B. Johnson goes to Congress and he asks for authority to escalate troops. And, and what Congress will do is they'll pass this Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Actually, before I mention that, I do want to mention something else. This report that Vietnamese boats torpedoed American destroyer ships was never actually substantiated. It may have never happened. We do know that we had destroyer ships out there that, that tried to attack North Vietnamese ships in defense of South Vietnamese forces, but there was no proof that destroyer ships were actually torpedoed by North Vietnamese ships. So that could have all just been made up or it could have been lost in translation. Something could have been reported incorrectly. It doesn't really matter at this point. Congress goes uh, under LBJ's request and they pass this Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Now this Gulf of Tonkin Resolution will basically give Lyndon B. Johnson an open ticket or an open check to do whatever he felt was necessary to protect American forces in Vietnam. So we're not declaring war, right? We're not going to say we're going to war with North Vietnam. What we're going to say is that LBJ can do whatever he feels like is necessary to protect American interests in Vietnam, even if that means going to war, even though it's a situation of war. So we have this escalation of the war now. Uh, that's going to happen after August of 1964. I'm going to show how the numbers grow rapidly using this chart. So you can see the numbers in 65 to 66 shoot up to over 300,000 troops in Vietnam. By 1967, we're over 400,000. By 1968 and 69, we're going to be over half a million troops. Now, by the way, in case I haven't mentioned this before, uh, my dad was in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, he fought in Vietnam. He went there from June of 68 to July of 69. So he was in there right as we had these these this peak number of troops over there. Uh, with that being said, just understand that everything I teach is going to be influenced by my own personal background. Uh, so understand that, which is going to be the case with any professor you have. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on. Now, there's going to be a real problem in waging this war, right? It's, it's not going to be like fighting the Japanese during World War II or the Germans in World War II or World War I. Uh, normally, when you fight wars, it's about gaining land, right? It's about taking land back from people who were holding land. That's not what this war is. When we're seeing the fighting in South Vietnam, this is going to be a South Vietnamese government 
that is trying to protect themselves from insurgent communists. So we're fighting not necessarily to regain land from communists, but to try to keep communists from gaining power. Now, since we're not really fighting for land and trying to take land back, it's going to be really hard to know when you're actually winning. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that, that we're going to fight this war and we're going to measure this using attrition and pacification. So essentially, in order to win the war, we have to kill more people than them by far. We want to put so much damage to them that they're going to want to quit. That's going to be the goal. Now, if we go back through the records, we know that the president, President Kennedy, President Johnson, neither of them really thought this was going to be a very winnable war because you never know who the enemy is and you're not really gaining any land, right? If you really want to win this war, what you probably have to do is destroy the North Vietnamese government and totally cripple anything that they have coming into them. Because keep in mind that the North Vietnamese government is being financed and equipped by communists in China and the Soviet Union. So China and the Soviet Union are financing and equipping North Vietnam Vietnamese forces and North Vietnam is supporting communists in South Vietnam. So you really have to destroy that North Vietnamese communist complex, and we're not going to be doing that. But our fighting is going to be in South Vietnam as a measure to protect American interests in South Vietnam and protect the South Vietnamese government. Uh, so this idea of attrition is going to be very difficult. It's going to wind up working very well. Now, I'll give you a couple of numbers just to show. If we're going to say that attrition wins the war, then we're going to say this. By the end of the war, the United States is going to lose around 58,000 troops. About 58,000 Americans die in the Vietnam conflict or war. North Vietnam is going to lose over, uh, if you combine North Vietnam and Viet Cong, which we'll talk about in just a moment, uh, then, I'm surprised I don't have that on here. We'll have to come back to that. Uh, actually, let me go back here real quick because I think there must have been a term that I didn't use. Okay, so I'll make sure you know this term here, National Liberation Front. Uh, we'll come back to those numbers in just a moment. I want to make sure you know who National Liberation Front is first. So National Liberation Front is going to be the communists in South Vietnam who are going to be rebelling against the South Vietnamese government that the United States is backing. So that's going to be that kind of the political entity. National Liberation Front. The people fighting for National Liberation Front are going to be called the Viet Cong. Now, I'm probably going to use the word VC, starting with Viet Cong, uh, because this is going to be recorded um, speech to text, so I'm, I may use the word Viet Cong, but I may forget, uh, just because uh, I'm used to saying the term VC much more than Viet Cong. So again, the National Liberation Front are South Vietnamese communists, and the Viet Cong are the people fighting. They tend to wear, like, uh, all black, and they carry around these rules, and we'll see them in, in just a little bit. So in South Vietnam, we're fighting against the Viet Cong, or National Liberation Front, and they're being supported by the NVA, which is the North Vietnamese Army. So both of those, the VC and the NVA, are going to be communist. One's in North Vietnam, one's in South Vietnam. Now, go back to those numbers. So we lose 58,000 American lives fighting in Vietnam. Uh, the South Vietnamese Army and civilians, not counting the VC, they're going to see close to 700,000 killed. In North Vietnam, if you combine North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, we're going to kill well over a million of them, around 65,000 civilians, uh, mostly in North Vietnam. Uh, and over a million military. So we kill over a million of their military, they kill 58,000 of our military. So if you go by the numbers and death toll, we win. But that's not what it's about, right? It's about stopping the fighting ongoing. So we'll move on to this. So uh, we're going to be fighting mainly the VC, the Viet Cong, up until about 1968. So from 19, the early 1960s, 
uh, up until 1968, when we're fighting, it's normally going to be South Vietnamese communists. Uh, but by the time we get to January of 1968, I want to see this expand with North Vietnamese forces coming down to South Vietnam. This will lead to something called the Tet Offensive. Um, so I'm going to play a brief video. Again, there's more I could say about this, but I'm going to run out of time if I don't get to the video. So let's go ahead and play a brief video uh, that will describe the Tet Offensive to some extent. And it will also, go back over here, also go in more detail on something called the Battle of Way. Uh, the Battle of Way, we're going to show, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have it close to set up on my YouTube side. I'm going to set it up for you guys over here. You know, the, 
was such a black pajama guy with a big cartridge belt and a rifle. These guys were full uniform, packed, new or near new uh, SKSs and AK-47s. They were as well equipped or better equipped than we were. fights in one of the first critical engagements in Way, where he helps to defend the U.S. Army Command Center. And as night set in, we realized that, you know, we'd seen NBA everywhere. And one of the guys I knew was from Texas, and we were discussing the album. He said, I now know how they feel. I said, I agree with you. He says, we're probably outnumbered, you know, five or ten to one. I said, I can agree with that, too. That didn't bother me. I think if we'd known it was 50 or 100 to one that first night or two, that might have bothered us. When the smoke lifts the next morning, it's clear that the U.S. and South Vietnamese forces are facing a massive enemy. Their counterattack will begin one of the longest and bloodiest battles of the war, and it will reveal a covert North Vietnamese atrocity of staggering proportions, a secret crime that haunts Vietnam to this day. After being rocked back on their heels by the massive movement of arms and soldiers in the sneak attack during the Tet holiday, the armies of the U.S. and South Vietnam begin the counterattack. Way was a complete surprise to everyone, I think, officers included. It was uh, building to building fighting. You actually saw the enemy. It was more like, uh, I guess, like a World War II kind of thing. Where you were, there were lines, defenses, you knew where they were basically. And it was a matter of getting them out of there. The battle was street to street, one house at a time. We were in the new part of the city, which was the beautiful homes, the university, the hospital, the prison. They had a sports club right on the river. I mean, it was it was like being in any town USA. The NBA took way in about two hours. It will take the Marines almost a month to retake way. The city will be secured on February 27, 1968. Unfortunately, because of the weather, and they were trying to keep it together, they restricted our air and artillery support. It was told for a while, and then finally we ended up having to get rid of two-plus regiments of NBA. We pretty much destroyed it. There wasn't any other choice. Once again, television is there, and it scenes from the protracted battles for Huey, or Bloody Huey, as it comes to be known, come to symbolize the conflict. There is one piece of footage and one photograph that comes to represent the chaos and the tragedy of Tet. It didn't matter who that person was or what he had done, what we saw was a very large, imposing Vietnamese chief of police, South Vietnamese chief of police, who was supposed to be our ally, shooting somebody in the head who had his hands uh, tied behind his back. Adams took the photo just on one off. It is a summary execution without judge or behind the photo is more complex. You guys notice I skipped that little part where he was shot. <laughs> now know that the general was actually a nice guy and Eddie Adams even became friends with him you know, uh, afterward and apologized to him for taking the photo that, that probably ruined his reputation. But, uh, but nonetheless, that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is the lasting impression of this image of brutality. This image became symbolic of the uh, sort of moral um, equivalence of our guys and the bad guys. Our guys were just as bad, you know, as, as this image proved. It was a shot around the world. Another major media moment in the, uh, in the, in the Tet Offensive was Peter Arnett did an interview with a, a U.S. major um, where he published a quote from the interview where the major said, we had to destroy the town in order to save it. 
this was something that was repeated over and over again as, as proof that, uh, uh, you know, when the anti-war movement repeated it, as proof that the, the uh, U.S. effort in Vietnam was brutal, that it was aggressive, that it was overwhelming. This idea that we were destroying villages in order to save them made no sense. The greatest secret of all intent is that winning and losing are not what they appear to be. The United States and South Vietnam are killing tens of thousands of the enemy. But on the home front, the battles are seen differently. The military said that it was a military failure because they told them, with the exception of that, there's a way they did hold But the American people weren't ready to listen to the military. They felt that they had misled us about the success of the war. And if they said that that was a failure, I forget which of the senators said, if that's a failure, God keep us from a big success. one stadium and there was a smell that was overwhelming and I ran across and there were guys there working and I said what happened they found mass graves I had heard I've heard everything from two to five thousand one of the hidden stories of tent is the murders of way this is why you know when the, when they become occupied that I mean a way very defensive they execute more than 4,000 people because these people did not want to cooperate with the quote-unquote revolution. They killed 4,000 of them, maybe more. The North Vietnamese came into play in a very well-planned assault. Came in with clipboards, names of people who had helped the government of South Vietnam there were people who they decided they wanted to get rid of. And anybody who they thought could possibly help the side of the South Vietnamese government was taken out and killed. Even today, the communist government glosses over the secret murders. In 1968, the murders are not the main story. We went door to door talking to people about what had happened to them or their family members during the Battle of Quay while it was under occupation by the communist forces. Some of those people broke down in tears as we knocked on their doors and asked them what had happened because it was so painful. There was a lot of dispute as to whether this was this killing in Quay, but I came away with no doubt whatever. Okay, and uh, oops, let me put my camera back on. Okay, so you guys were able to watch the video, hear the video. Is that correct? Did you guys have any problems with that? Oops, let me come back here. Let's see. Okay, let me go back to share my file again. Yes, good, thank you. Okay, and uh, we're gonna wrap up in just a minute or two. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up where Wei was uh, also once, uh, We'll start our next class, uh, but I'm just going to say just a couple of final things about uh, Tet Offensive uh, before we do that. So let me move on real quick and pick up where we last left off. Okay, so that Tet Offensive is this big offensive. You're going to have somewhere around 80,000. Your textbook says 70,000. 
Uh, usually when I see uh, the numbers, it's usually around 80,000 or so or 84,000 uh, troops. All in one day, Tet is the Vietnamese New Year, if you didn't catch that. Uh, in one day, you're going to see this massive offensive. The idea behind Tet, uh, this Tet Offensive rather, is to try to get a widespread revolution. Right? The communists in North Vietnam and the communists in South Vietnam believe that people are, are unhappy enough in South Vietnam to overthrow the government in Saigon and, and defeat the Americans. But they don't see that mass uprising, which is why the military advisors will say that this was a failed execution of, of an offensive by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. But we're going to see maybe it was successful, but maybe successful in a different way. So we'll expand on how that was or was not successful next class period. Uh, so it's 10.50 now. I'll go and let you guys go for anybody who has something that comes up at 11 o'clock. We'll finish off the Tet Offensive next class, maybe talk a little bit more about how this war was fought by the Americans and actually uh, fought by the Viet Cong as well. And uh, we're going to break up Vietnam with LBJ and Nixon. We're going to come back to Nixon uh, as well. I'll go and let you guys go for the day. Uh, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, but only two classes left until final exam. All right, take care. Bye. Thank you.